Um, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, my name is Heidi and I am a librarian with Denver Public Library. Um, and I'm joined here with my colleague, Dodi. Um, I just wanted to kind of start by sharing a little bit um, as an intro. Um, for me, uh, wolves have been a passion and a source of joy for as long as I can remember. Um, I think that they can teach us many things. They can teach us about strength and resilience, but I think they can also teach us about kindness and love. And I know that you'll all agree that they evoke something in us in ways that few other animals can. And specifically, I know like many of you who are here tonight, um, I carry the story of 06 with me in life. And so I'm absolutely over the moon to welcome Rick McIntyre here tonight. Few people are able to invite us into the world of wolves the way that Rick in his writing can. Um, so before I turn it over to Dodie um, for a few announcements, I just want to offer my sincerest and heartfelt thanks to both Rick and Tom, our facilitator, for your work and for being here tonight. And let's see here. Here are um, the books that Rick's written. Um, let me hear Heidi if you want me to talk about these. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please do. Please jump in. <laughs> um, so, um, what we're going to be talking about? Well, part of what we're leading was leading up to um, this discussion is Rick's most uh, recent book in the Yellowstone series, the Alpha Wolves of Yellowstone series, is the Alpha Female Wolf. And I saw Rick talking about this last fall at the Mountain Plains um, Booksellers Association conference. And in five short minutes, he had everyone in the room captivated and wanting to know how they could help um, help with wolves. So um, this is the fourth book in the series. You don't have to read them in order, but it doesn't hurt if you do. And um, they're from Greystone Books. And Greystone Books is a publisher that has a very deep focus on um, nature, science, um, animal conservation, land conservation. So um, I would say that um, Rick and Greystone books are a terrific match. And then tonight our bookseller is going to be um, the Bookies. Um, they are a Denver-based bookstore. Um, they have a, a, a very interesting mission that I'd like to share with you. Um, wait. I changed my screen, here we go. They have been serving the Denver community for over 50 years. They're driven by community service rather than profits and are committed to literacy, freedom of, of expression, diversity, equity and inclusion and environmental sustainability. In keeping with their mission, 10% of all book sales at the bookies from the bookies are donated to a nonprofit organization book give. And I'll put that link in the chat later. Um, by shopping with us or shopping with the bookies, you are helping get more books into more hands and out of landfills and recycling bins. And they have been a terrific partner to Denver Public Library. So I think now it's like on with the show. All right. Um, thank you, Dodie. And uh, Rick, are you still there? Can you hear me all right? Yes, Tom. How about me? Can you hear me? I can. There we go. Okay, wonderful. Great. Uh, I'd like to start off by just introducing myself. My name is Tom Zieber. I've been uh, working intermittently off and on uh, with wolves and four wolves for the past three decades. And uh, having grown up in California, I moved out to Colorado to attend the Colorado School of Mines, the engineering school. I graduated with a uh, Bachelor of Science in Petroleum Engineering. However, during my schooling, I became um, absolutely passionate and infatuated and enthralled with wolves. And after graduation, I decided that I'd rather move down to uh, a, a facility called Mission Wolf, which is down near Pueblo, and is uh, where I 
ended up working with Captables for almost a decade and a half. And because of my, uh, my knowledge of wolves, I was uh, recruited to be a biological technician in Yellowstone National Park in 1997, where I was able to um, uh, for initially work on a den study and where I, I met Rick. And for the next five years, I worked up in the park seasonally on a number of different um, wolf project assignments, including the, the well-known winter study. And I'm very proud that uh, Rick and myself were the first two people to inaugurate the Druid uh, Road Management Project. And that was a situation where the Druids had, um, ha had their den site close to a road and there was a lot of attention. And our job was basically uh, to stop traffic and make sure that, that, that the wolves had a safe place to cross the road. Uh, and I think um, with that, I'd like to introduce Rick, who has seen more wolves than any other person in the history of the world and uh, has a lot of wonderful insight. And Rick, I was wondering if you would like to share some of our experiences at that time. Well, th thanks, Tom. Uh, yeah, I have a lot of <laughs> real interesting memories from those years. As you said, um, we were kind of the uh, crossing guards for the wolves. So we both had red stop signs and um, we would station ourselves at opposite ends of the crossing area. We had uh, government radios that we could speak back and forth on. So when um, we had perhaps alpha male 21 starting to come down from the den toward the road and we got word that the pups were following their father, then both of us at our respective ends of the uh, crossing area would stand in the middle of the road uh, in our uniforms with our big red signs, stop traffic until they all got across the road in an orderly fashion and then um, let traffic go. Um, so uh, it, it was a very unique job situation. <laughs> Hard to kind of put down on a normal uh, resume. <laughs> I, I think that was a very unique yeah, situation was, for us, but we accomplished a lot of good. It, I think so too. Uh, not only did we help the wolves out directly, but I remember that we, we talked to uh, quite literally thousands of people who were interested in, in wolves and specifically the druids there. And uh, I think that also does a lot of good. You know, um, I have one fond memory of that, of that the, 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 the road project. And, and it seems like we went over every conceivable situation that could happen, but what we did not plan for was when um, some of the pups had followed the adults down to the road and the adults just kept going they crossed the river and went off did their thing and the pups ended up staying down on the center line of the road and started playing and we didn't really know exactly what to do with that because we had to stop traffic and traffic started backing up and and these wolves were just having a great time and i think a lot of people were very excited to see that but uh, it was a very interesting situation yeah i remember that and um we never thought we'd have to deal with a situation like that. So we didn't really know what to do. I called one of the law enforcement rangers and he came along and he didn't know what to do either. And we we're starting to get a lot of complaints. People needed to get through. So in desperation, the ranger drove me down to the pups and I got out and I kind of banged on the side of the, the door. And that was enough to cause the pups to run back uphill. So I, I kind of felt a little bit guilty about that, but, uh, by that time, we were getting concerned the pups were, were getting too comfortable with playing on the road. And of course, that could get them killed. So that was another unique thing. Yes, indeed. Indeed, it was. So I was, um, I was in the park all the way up until about 2001, again, seasonally. And, uh, you know, what I'm really interested here is about your book is that the, your most recent book in the Alpha Wolf series is the Alpha Female Wolf, of course, that's the title of your most recent book. And really, the, I think the center attraction in the book has to be the 06 female. And she was born a number of years after I left the park. And uh, But what I do remember is that I was able to watch her mom, that is Wolf 472, mm -hmm 
when she was a very young pup and later on when she was a yearling and that was that whole dramatic mm -hmm. situation where um 40 had been killed and 42 um ended up taking um uh, raising all those pups by her well with the with the pack's help of course but i thought that was a very interesting situation and i imagine you must have known 472 pretty well yeah so she was born in the year 2000 and we don't really have time to uh, get into too much of the background but um 472 who became the mother of our main character her mother in human terms was uh, uh, could possibly be clarified as a, a psychopath. She was a very, very violent wolf. And the other females had to organize. They rebelled against her and actually killed her. She was so extreme. I'm saying that because um, after the death of 472's mother, she was raised by the next alpha female, Wolf 42, had exactly the opposite personality. She uh, was uh, one of the best alpha females we ever had at getting everyone to work together and to cooperate. So it was a, a fascinating example of, of whoops, nature versus uh, nurture. She was born to a, a very violent mother, but raised by a very nonviolent uh, um, surrogate. And uh, I think maybe with that as a background, why don't I just go on to um, get into the story of 06. So she's called the 06 female because she was born in the spring of 2006. Her mother had dispersed from the Druid Peak Pack, had uh, helped to start a new pack that became known as Agud Creek. Um, there were many young females in that family that all had gray coats, as did 06. And to separate them, we just began to try to figure out how we could give them different designations. So there was an older sister, gray sister, who was born in the year 2007. She was called the 07 female. And then our main character, born in 2006, became known as the 06 female. And it, it took some time before we realized how special she was. She grew up in a very large family. She fit in very well. She was very social. And then when she was an adult, she took off on her own. And normally that would be the time where um, a young adult female tries to find a mate, settle down and start to, to raise pups. Um, she was very sought after by males during that time in her life. Um, by human standards, I, I think it's fair to say that she was drop dead gorgeous. She was the equivalent of a Disney princess where all the males lined up to court her. And at that stage in her life, she seemed like she couldn't care less about all these males coming toward her. And that's when we realized that she had a very strong personality and character, particularly in the sense that if any of those males displeased her in any way, if they were maybe a little bit too forward or too touchy-feely with her, she would just turn around and, and literally wipe them out, wipe the floor with them. Um, <laughs> And they were so afraid of her that they wouldn't even fight back, I, I guess, because they knew that she, that they were wrong. <laughs> and just one after another, uh, she dominated those males. And we thought that she would actually never settle down, that uh, she was just too strong willed to have be in a relationship with a male. And then in um, 2009, when she was middle-aged, something happened that was just unbelievable. She met two young brothers, 754 and 755. They were less than half her age. And there was something about them that did it for her. So despite the fact that she had been courted by older males who had plenty of experience, plenty of skills and knowledge, she picked these guys. And I, when I tell this story, I 
at this point, I oftentimes like to joke around with people just a, a little bit by um, comparing her story to a, an aspect of human endeavors where, um, I, I don't know if it's still a thing or not, but it, it used to be that if a, uh, let's say a, a woman of a certain age settled down with a guy that was younger than her, uh, she would be called a cougar. Have you heard that term, Tom? Uh, yes, and I, I'm pretty sure it is still being used quite frequently in our world. Okay, good. so it sometimes happens in Colorado. Anyway, um, she invented that term because she was easily twice the age of these guys. Um, I think in human terms, probably she was the equivalent of a woman maybe in her 30s and maybe even early 40s. And the two brothers were maybe the same as uh, a couple of brothers uh, that were sophomores in high school. So she was vastly older and more experienced than they were. And somehow that three-way relationship worked. So the, uh, they met in early 2009, and she had her first litter of pups that spring. She turned out to be a spectacularly uh, effective mother wolf. That year, she had to protect her young pups from grizzly bears, uh, all sorts of other threats. They all survived. She and the two males the, the next year moved to uh, Lamar Valley. And what uh, turned out to be just a, a spectacularly interesting story is that she ended up denning her second and third year at uh, the den site that her, where her own mother had been born several years earlier. So her story just got more and more interesting. I'll, I'll pause wow, for a second and see if you wanted to, to add anything. Sure. You know, um... You know, I think I think the 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 story of the two brothers is absolutely fascinating. And uh, what I was I was kind of wondering, um, why do you think 754 and 755 has such fealty towards each other? Why were they so loyal to each other? I was I was really amazed to know that they had actually joined the Druid Pack initially, but then they seemed to um, leave that pack for one reason or another. And, but instead of going their separate ways, they stayed together. Have, have you ever thought about that? Yeah, there, there's so much to get into on that. Um, I, I, I kind of skipped over the fact that they spent some time with the Druid females and I forget how many, but there might've been five or six. So they essentially dumped having five or six girlfriends and switched over to, to being with those six. Um, because I think they realized that the value that uh, that she presented to them. So that, that was just another fascinating aspect of that whole story. Um, I don't think I mentioned it, but 755 was, well, ended up as the alpha male, even though he was a little bit smaller than his brother. 754 had a very easygoing personality, and he seemed to just want to fit into the family. We'll, we'll talk more about him as we as we continue the timeline, but uh, there was just so many fascinating sure. relationships um, in that three-way situation. So then, Rick, what what made you realize that the 06 female was was this special and unique unique animal? And, and, and was it was it a single event or was it kind of a the, the accumulation of a number of events that all of a sudden you realize one day like wow what what a you know even for a wolf this is a very unique and special wolf well there's so many things to say tom first of all she probably in those early years was the most independent wolf that i've ever known she could do it all by herself and that's why we thought that she'd never settle down she could hunt by herself, make kills by herself. She seemed to be totally self-sufficient. Uh, I'm reminded um, back in the 60s at the start of Women's Liberation, there was a bumper sticker that said, I think something like this, a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. And so uh, <laughs> that could have been her slogan during that uh, portion of her life. So I, I've already said this, but I'll, I'll repeat it because it was just so fascinating that 
such a self-sufficient independent female can finally decide to settle down with these two guys and it just didn't make sense. Um, but the more we watched those two males, we saw that they really grew into ultra, um, let's see, what would be the word, ultra competent um, uh, partners for 06. They became great hunters, great defenders of, of the family. And I, I think maybe this is the point where I'd, I'd, I'd really like to get into maybe the most dramatic moment in 06's life, um, the story that we call the Great Den Raid. Um, sure. So to lay the foundation for that story, I need to back up just a little bit. Um, 06's ancestors for many, many generations had had a long running feud with another family of wolves that was known as Molly's Pack. And um, at the time that I'm leading up to in 06's life, um, during that period, the Molly's Pack was led by an especially aggressive and violent alpha female who was known as Wolf 686. She and her family during that period had killed something like nine other wolves in surrounding territories, probably the most violent alpha female that we've ever had. And this long running feud between 06's ancestors and 686's ancestors came to her head during 06's time at the Druid Den. I think it was when she was raising her second litter. We had word that the Molly's pack did not have any pups that spring. And so they were free to travel back and forth wherever they wanted to, whereas 06 was um, pretty much limited to staying with her pups at her den. So as I give that background to the story, uh, we were positioned um, at a parking lot where we could watch the den area. As Tom knows, the pups were born at a site in a forest. So um, it was actually rare that we would get any glimpses of the pups until they were older. We just would primarily watch for the adults to come and go, um, go to the den to feed the mother wolf and pups and then leave on hunts. So one day as we were watching that, we got word that a large pack of wolves were seen a few miles to the west. Uh, back then, since I was working for the park, I had telemetry, telemetry equipment. I got it out and I got signals from the Molly's wolves. And then a short time later, we spotted them heading on a trail directly toward 06's den. We got a count of 17 wolves led by their super violent alpha female. They disappeared into the thick trees and we just couldn't see what was happening, but I was totally stressed out because they were going directly toward where we assumed 06 was with her pups who were only a few weeks old at that point and at that age, totally helpless. Now, I also knew from signals that the two adult males were there as well in the den for 754 and 755, along with a few other younger adults. And um, as we desperately watched the den forest to try to figure out what was happening, suddenly out of the trees, a huge group of wolves ran out at top speed at about 35 miles an hour, running in our direction toward the park road. It took a few moments for me to figure out what actually was happening. And then what I clearly saw was 06 was running for her life at absolutely top speed, 35 miles an hour, despite having given birth to her pups just a, a, a week or so earlier running for a life due to the fact that 17 wolves led by 686 were chasing her. And I saw that 06 had made a, a, a terrible mistake, a terrible misjudgment. 
she was heading straight in a direction that would take her to the top of a cliff. And to me at that moment, it was literally like watching an Indiana Jones movie where the bad guys were chasing him and realized that he was gonna be trapped at the top of a cliff. She was gonna to have to turn around and by herself fight 17 wolves. But I had underestimated her because when she got at the top of that cliff, somehow apparently she had planned this out in case of an emergency. And she had found a chute that she ran straight down to the park road, ran across the pavement, went a few hundred yards further west, and then turned around to look what was happening. And what she could see along with myself, that 686 and all those other wolves were too afraid to run down the route that 06 had just done. So she had stymied them. And for at least a few moments, they didn't know what to do. So time was standing still. Those six, 17 wolves were milling around. 06 was watching them. And then 686 decided what her next move was going to be. She turned around and she led her pack at a run back into the forest, which meant that now her mission was to find O6's den, grab the pups and kill them. So uh, we're only at the very beginning of that very dramatic confrontation. Now I already mentioned that I was getting the signal from the two males. And as best as I can figure from the signals, um, they were standing guard in front of the den, which was the exact direction where the 17 wolves were running toward. So um, if all of you can visualize in your mind a den opening with very, very young pups in there that essentially were helpless, um, with the two brothers standing guard, like they were the bodyguards in front of the entrance to the den, as 17 wolves were charging at them. And how can two brothers on their own deal with an opposing force of 17 animals that are out to kill them and then kill the pups? As um, 06 stayed on the other side of the road in a safe position, she now had a trust in her judgment that when she picked those guys, they were gonna come through for her and her family right now. Um, you can imagine how stressful and frustrating it was for us to be just standing there. We were, of course, helpless as well. Um, we just didn't know what was happening, but in our mind, we were imagining just the terrible amount of violence that was probably taking place up there in the trees after I forget how long it was, maybe 20, maybe 30 minutes, something like that. All 17 wolves came back into sight. They left the area on exactly the same route that they had come into by. And um, we ourselves were still in the same situation. We had no idea what had just happened. I stayed there for the rest of the day until it got dark. 06 and uh, the younger, adults in the pack went up into the forest. I continue to get the signals from the two males. As Tom knows, the radio collars that we use here in Yellowstone have some electronics in them that essentially is a motion detector. And they're programmed that if there's no motion exhibited by the wolf for four hours straight, the beeps per minute that are sent out on a radio frequency double. We call that the mortality signal. So as it was getting too dark to see anything, I did one last signal check and both of the callers were giving out the normal signal, but less than four hours had gone by since the likely attack on the family. So it really didn't mean anything. The, the two brothers could have easily have been dead for several hours and um, the four hours just had not been up. So when I had to go home based on the fact that we couldn't see anything, I was still totally stressed out, just not knowing what had really happened. Um, I got up at about um, 
4 a.m. the next morning, rushed out there. And as I approached the den in my car, I could operate the telemetry equipment. I got 755 signal and it was normal. Mm. And then I tried his brother and it was the normal signal as well, meaning that at least I knew that they were alive. I got 06, 06's signal, that was normal too. Um, I gradually saw all of the adults over the next couple of days. It took us a while because the pups were so young, but eventually we saw that the entire litter of pups had survived the invasion. What a story. Wow. Wow. And um, it is. Go ahead, John. Oh, that, that, it's a fascinating story. And I've seen the video footage that Bob Landis took, and it, it is harrowing. To watch, uh, to watch the Molly's pack come out of that forest as one big mob of wolves. It's just, it's just so intimidating. You can feel the drama just watching, just watching the, the footage, I feel. Uh, Rick, what do, you, what do you think was the Molly's pack motivation? Why would they want to uh, leave their central territory to come all the way up to the Lamar Valley and try to destroy the Lamar Canyon pack? Well, I, I mentioned in passing earlier that there had been a multi-generation feud between those two genetic lines. And that goes back to um, 1996, when the ancestors of the Maui's wolves, who back then were known as the Crystal Creek Pack, they denned very, very close to where 06 denned um, as we were telling the story. Mm. Um, but they were attacked by a group of wolves that was brought in in the second year of the reintroduction, the Druid wolves. And the Druid wolves killed the alpha male in the Crystal Creek family, along with all of their pups. There were only two surviving wolves, the uh, mother wolf and a young adult male. So based on that attack, they had to flee their territory. They moved south, they settled into Pelican Valley. And because they no longer lived anywhere near Crystal Creek, they were renamed Molly's Pack after Molly Beatty, who was very responsible in, in getting the reintroduction happening in Yellowstone. They thrived down there. Uh, they increased their numbers over the, the generations. But I always felt due to that attack on their family, uh, that even though many, many generations had gone by, there was just something in the culture of that pack that made them super aggressive. And uh, in, in human terms, it's kind of like, uh, I don't know, the Hatfields and the McCoys or you know whatever you want to say, the Red Sox and the Yankees, uh, uh, whatever comparison you want to make. So they just had a grudge against the wolves that lived in Lamar Valley. And 06 was descended from the wolves that had attacked the original um, Crystal Creek wolves. So uh, there's just so many facets to this story that, that are fascinating. Absolutely, absolutely. And, I, I, and you know, 754 and 755 really, I have to feel that they were they they acted heroically that day, defending defending the den site yeah. against such a such a large mm -hmm. number of of aggressive wolves. I was wondering if you could contrast 754 and 755's actions with some other males you might have known that haven't acted <laughs> in such a heroic manner. Yeah, I'm laughing because. Uh, I think you know who I'm going to use as an example here, and that's good old Wolf 302, who um, was um, probably the, the most gorgeous male wolf we've ever had here. Just absolutely stunning. He was the, the Brad Pitt of male wolves. And uh, females flocked to him, but um, he was completely unreliable and untrustworthy. And um, he would get females pregnant and abandon them, go back and live with his parents for a while. The next mating season, he'd uh, go on his, um, uh, his romantic adventures, get more females pregnant and abandon them. And 
he was just such a character. He, he eventually settled down and became a good, responsible father role uh, when he was very, very old. But um, he, he was really something to, to, to see. Uh, so he was at, for the vast majority of his life, the total opposite end of the spectrum from 754 and 755. They just could not have been more opposite. And I, I hadn't mentioned it, but for a while, um, 302 and 06 actually courted each other, but she correctly judged what 302 <laughs> was really like and dumped him and um, then ended up with these other guys who were uh, absolutely totally willing to uh, risk their lives to protect her pup. So she knew what she was doing when she was uh, choosing guys to pair off with. Absolutely. And I think one of the most fascinating aspects uh, of your books is, is demonstrating how these individual personalities really shape the, the success or failure of these packs. And, and, yes, and, and, and a female choosing the right mate is, is, seems to be really, really key and, um, and whatnot. So and now I was wondering, um, I, think, I, I think I remember that 06 had four pups born um, in that year. Um, four, yeah, there were four pups and she, what happened to those pups and how, how did that relate to her as a quality of her being a mother? When she had, I think, well, first, I think, I was thinking talking about her first litter here. Yes, uh -huh. I think uh, one way to maybe condense a lot of information is that um, over the course of her life, she had three litters. Um, I believe um, the number of her pups ended up totaling 13. She raised 13 sons and daughters. And um, uh, we could spend a lot of time talking about them, but how about if I just limit it to say that um, uh, of those 13, the, the daughter that became best known to us was 926. I'm writing about her right now in my next book. So after the, uh, the lifespan of 06, 926 took over the family. And um, she was a, a very worthy successor to her mother. Um, she uh, also had a very fierce personality. Um, and like her mother, she um, had this personality that enabled her to uh, just totally dominate all the males in her life. And just one quick story about 926 before we get back to her mother. And I love telling this story because it, it, it really encapsulates what, what her, her life was like. Um, it certainly has a, a sad component, but 926, like her mother, uh, picked a mate that was totally reliable and dependable. And um, he actually sacrificed his life to protect uh, 926 and their pups. He was killed by a group of rival wolves from the Prospect Peak Pack. And that happened when 926 was pregnant um, with her second litter. So she was a widow with six existing 11 and a half month old pups and a new litter on the way. So she was in a desperate situation and then it became infinitely worse because four of the males that killed her mate showed up at her den, apparently to finish the job and to kill her and her existing pups. So she could not have been in a more desperate situation. Um, it was the end of the day when I realized what was happening, like in that other story with her mother, I had to go home. And when I came back in the morning, during the nighttime, I documented that somehow she had converted all of those big males to her side. And from that point on, they devoted themselves to serving her and to raising the pups that had been sired by the male that they had just killed. So that was her power over male wolves. It was just an unbelievable wow. accomplishment. And she terrorized those guys. 
um, if they made a kill and then they started to eat and she showed up, boy, they would just all back away. The last thing that they ever wanted to do was to get between her and food because despite her little size, she would just wipe them out. So she was a, 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 a fitting successor to her mother. Yeah, I, I believe the, the wolf watcher name for her was something akin to Spitfire. Is that correct? I, I, I didn't use that. We always called her uh, 926. But yeah, she was a tough lady. You did not want to mess with her. Excellent. And then so going going back to 06, after after this encounter with the Molly's pack, what was the what was the next phase in her life? Well, there, boy, there's so much to talk about, Tom. We could really do this all night, but um, I, I'm kind of looking at our time and what our obligations are. So I think we do need to kind of move on a bit. So let me just summarize a few things. Um, I've already mentioned that she had three litters. Um, she was very, very well served by the two males that um, she had chosen, 755 and uh, 754. Uh, she did a great, great job of raising her sons and daughters. And uh, we're going to jump ahead to late 2012. So that was the year that uh, she was raising her third litter. Um, in December of that year, the hunting in their home territory um, was not very productive. And we think that's why they took a chance of leaving their territory. They started to move east. That meant that um, after a few hours of traveling, they passed through the eastern border of Yellowstone National Park, near where I am speaking right now in Silvergate, Montana. I'm sure the wolves didn't understand it. They, they didn't know what a park service border meant. But to us, Here's what it meant. When they crossed over that line into a part of Wyoming, that meant that they were in a legal wolf hunting zone. By that time, um, in the, yellow, the story of the Yellowstone wolf reintroduction, wolves had increased enough in the surrounding area that both in Montana and in Wyoming, there was now legal wolf hunting. And unknowingly, 06 walked into that section of Wyoming uh, to try to see if she could find some elk to hunt and feed her family. Um, this is what we know happened uh, when they got out there. They were seen by a man that had a legal permit to shoot and kill a wolf. He saw the family, and the way that we understand it, like probably most hunters, um, he was a trophy hunter. He uh, wanted to take as a trophy the biggest and the most impressive wolf in the family. And that wolf was not what in most packs would be the big alpha male. He was 06. She was the biggest wolf in the family. Mm -hmm. Our understanding is that he saw the pack, picked out the biggest wolf, took aim and pulled the trigger. He hit the 06 female. We don't know if that bullet killed her instantly or if she survived for a while. What we do know is something that's, it's gonna be hard for me to describe because it's such an emotional story. Um, he was later interviewed by a friend of mine and he told my friend what happened after he pulled the trigger. He was getting ready to go retrieve her. He was with a friend, but the two of them noticed that even though um, nearly all of the family members had run away at the sound of the shot. One wolf was staying with the fallen 06. It was 755. 
And he was desperately trying to get her up and get her to run away because he could see the two men approaching. 755, as we understand it, based on what he told my friend, was pawing at, at 06, trying to get her up, trying to get her away. Um, the two men stopped and were really taken with what they saw. And to their credit, they decided to walk away to give 755 some time. However, they were legally obligated by sunset to turn in the, to the check station that was run by Wyoming Fish and Game. So they returned a few hours later as the day was getting closer to sunset and 755 was still there, still trying to get her up. He still didn't understand that she was dead. Um, so they just had to go to retrieve her. And as they got closer and closer, only then did he reluctantly run away. So that part of the story is always such an emotional one for me to relate to people. That that was the that was the bond between them. Uh, that he risked his life to try to save her. And an amazing display of the the bonds of affection that wolves have for each other, to say the least. And, uh, you know, I, I was reading in your book how you said, I believe that you went out the, the next day, or I suppose it was the day that you found out that 06 had been shot, and you had a pretty good day out in the field. And uh, it, that in, ended up in a conversation um, with another person. You said, well, it was a good day watching wolves. You had seen some interesting events. However, there was, there was, another, there was another event shortly thereafter that kind of brought this whole thing full circle. And I was wondering if you'd like to discuss that. Yes, yeah. Just to expand a little bit on what you uh, touched upon. Um, it's right, I believe I was the first person out in the field to get word that 06 had been killed. It was really the next morning. Dan Staler, who you know, called me because he had just gotten word from Wyoming Fish and Game I was already in the park. I was on my way to check on signals from other wolf packs. And I knew absolutely for sure that um, sooner or later I was going to run into our, our normal cadre of what we call wolf watchers, people that spent a lot of time in Yellowstone looking for the wolves and watching them. Um, I met up with, oh, probably was about 15 people at one particular viewpoint. And I just had to step out of my car in my ranger uniform. And I figured the best thing to do was just to tell them straight on what had just happened. And um, I remember one woman was just so devastated by the news of 06 death that she literally collapsed and, and was sobbing. And um, so I, I just had to attend to her um and then when she uh was able to recover a bit um speak to everyone else we started to share our favorite memories of 06 what helped was a few days later 755 um brought back um the pack to lamar um we could see that that they were okay so we had that that helped us um balance out the tragedy that uh, we had just gone through um, time went by, and as it is in normal human endeavors, when you lose a, a maid, a child, a parent, whatever, um, sometimes with the passage of time, things get a little bit more back to normal, not ever completely, but a little bit. And I guess, as I'm about to tell this last story, I, I was feeling that I, I, had gotten to the point where I had, I had coped with what we had gone through and I was getting back to normal or sort of normal. And then something, <laughs> something happened that really hit me pretty, pretty, pretty hard. I was asked by a, a local school. Uh, I'm gonna say is a school that um, 
was in a town that was known to be somewhat anti-wool. They were gonna bring the entire school district to Yellowstone and they wanted me to give them a talk. And I do that all the time. You did as well when we worked together. So that's normal for me. So I met the school. Since it was a small town, <laughs> the entire school district was one teacher and I think eight students. Um, and um, that was fine with me. I, I, I like working with kids. And so the teacher, a woman, introduced me and said that I study wolves in Yellowstone. And she said I was going to tell them all about well, family life and what they're like. And uh, I was in my full ranger uniform with the hat and everything. And so everything was normal to me until what happened next. Um, before I could even speak, one of the boys, I think he was a kindergartner because he looked like he was about five years old. And you know how kids are at that age. They, they just start talking <clears throat> and there's not much you can do about it. So he wanted to tell me something. And so in front of everyone else, here is what he said. I know the man that shot that famous wolf. So I'm standing there thinking, how do I respond to that? And of course, I knew absolutely he was talking about 06. It had only been a short time since she was killed. And the dilemma that I was in is I was on duty as a park ranger. Um, I had to be very careful how I responded to him. My own feelings and position naturally would have caused me in most situations to say something like, yes, we all loved 06. It was such a tragedy that she was shot and killed. And we wish that that had never happened and she was still with us. But if I was to say something like that, it was likely that when those kids went back home and around the dinner table, when their parents asked, what did you do today? And they said, well, this park ranger talked to us about walls. It would be very easy for them to say something like the ranger said it was so, it was too bad that she had to be killed um, or implied that I was, um, well, it, it just could have gone really wrong. So I was trying to figure out, well, how, how do I say something here uh, that's the right thing to say that um, doesn't get me in trouble? And I just have to admit straight out, I wasn't smart enough to figure out what to say. So I was just standing there like a dummy. And then it got worse because he wasn't done with me. <laughs> there was more to come. So after saying, I know the man that shot that famous wolf, the next thing he wanted to tell me was, and my daddy just bought a license to kill a wolf. So now what do I do? Uh, I definitely can't say, well, you know, I wish that uh, people wouldn't do that. Um, I, I was just totally stymied once more. I looked at the teacher like, can you help me here? <laughs> and she didn't know what to do either. So it was pretty much the worst moment of my career. And I thought, okay, I'm just going to take my badge off, throw it on the ground, walk away and, and drive off into the sunset for good. Um, and then I saw that the boy was opening his mouth and was about to say something else. And I'm thinking, it's going to get worse. Um, so he already told me he knew the man that shot the famous wolf. He already told me that his daddy just bought a license to kill a wolf. Now he was going to tell me something else. And I'm thinking, I'm expecting the absolute worst. So in front of the teacher, all the other kids, and in front of me, this is the third thing that he said. He said, but I hope he doesn't. <laughs> but I hope he doesn't kill a wolf. Wow. That changed everything. That changed everything. And what I took from that incident was something that I think is a proper way to wind up our story. We were still at that point grieving over the loss of 06. And we were trying to make sense of it. She had lived such a spectacular life. She was loved by so many people. And she had such a tra tragic end to her life. 
But as Tom, I think, knows, um, our local filmmaker, Bob Landis, had already put together a documentary on the life of 06 and had been broadcast on TV and gotten huge ratings. And I think there's a pretty good chance that what had happened was that that young boy had seen that documentary, that he knew 06's life story. He also knew the man that killed her. And knowing her story, knowing her heroic biography, when his dad came home and told the son that he had a license to kill a wolf, that was the boy's response. After knowing 06's life story, growing up in an anti-wolf town, he wanted his father to know that he hoped that he wouldn't kill a wolf. So that's how I like to finish up 06's story of that's the impact that she had on that boy and I'm sure on thousands, maybe millions of other people based on that documentary. Absolutely, absolutely. I, you know, I never, never really got to see those six female maybe more than once or twice and even then very sparingly. And yet her story is so compelling to me. Um, it's really provided a huge part of the motivation that I've had here in Colorado uh, with our, with our in, uh, upcoming wolf reintroduction to really push right off the bat that we would not have wolf hunting in Colorado. Um, because I just, uh, I just don't mm -hmm. see a good reason for it. And I think, um, I think with that, Rick, we're, we're pretty much sounds like we're kind of at our, uh, we're at about seven o'clock right now. And we've really mm -hmm. finished the story. I think that you wanted to share about the 06 female and, and whatnot. And, um, I have I have some questions here in um, in our, our Q and A uh, um, and if you're willing, um, I have a couple questions I'd love to ask as well. And uh, sure. what do you mm -hmm. think about that? All right, so sure. However, you mm -hmm. yeah, however okay. you and our hosts want to proceed, everything's fine with me. All right, so. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to read a, a question from chat first um, from, I, I believe it's a, somebody named Molly here um, who, who says she was up there wolf watching with you in late February. Um, somebody else named Lisa was there at the same time, if that jogs your memory. Uh, but she, she wanted to see if you could give any updates on how the junction are, junctions are doing. Um, specifically, sure. who's mm -hmm. pregnant, who is Denny, where, how, and how <laughs> spring is treating them overall. Okay, sure. Yeah, the pregnancy report. <laughs> uh, yes, for people that are listening to us that might not be too familiar, the, the Junction Butte pack is the, uh, the main pack that, that people get to see and watch here in Yellowstone. Um, they're based in the Northern Range. I, we uh, saw them yesterday. And uh, they have about 25 members. It's uh, our largest pack. The average pack is only 10. And they have a fascinating story because their longtime alpha female, 907, is going to be 10 years old this spring. She's the oldest wolf in the park. And um, in the wild, uh, the average lifespan of wolves is only about five years. Um, so she's twice as or twice the uh, has twice the lifespan of a normal Yellowstone wolf, and in human years, she's probably the equivalent to a woman that's about seventy-eight. Um, female wolves don't have the equivalent of menopause, so she's about to have her eighth litter of pups. In fact, her due date is tomorrow, and uh, I could go on and on. I could talk for hours about nine oh seven. She's the main character in the, the current book that I'm writing, and she's just had a spectacular life. She's had a lot of uh, sisters that she's had to deal with, rival sisters, aggressive sisters, and um, she somehow has always figured out a way to come out on top. Um, she just has this great life story, and uh, maybe um, we can all get together at some point in the future when my next book comes out 
and we can spend a, a good hour talking about 907's life story because in, in many ways, uh, she's uh, a pretty good match for the 06 female. I'd say of all the females I've, I've known in Yellowstone, those two are a pretty good match for each other in terms of accomplishments. Uh, and, uh, and then there's, a, there's another question here. And I think I think you maybe um, you can you can help answer this, Rick. Is is um, Elaine wants to know if 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 people can watch the documentary of 06 and how how can they do that? Yeah, let me think. Um, hmm. I, I I assume you're. I think you're, what you're I'll have to... to do is when we finish up, I'll. What I'm thinking is I can research that and give the information to uh, our posts at the library and um, they can maybe post it on um, that Heidi or Dodie. Is that something you guys can do when I get back to you? Totally. Yep. We can help you okay, with that. Okay, great. Yes. Yeah. So I'll take care of that. That's done by Bob Landis. And uh, oh, yeah, you know, I, I believe I do remember the title. I believe it's called She Wolf. She Wolf. And um, so you could Google that. You could uh, Google Bob Landis. That's L A N D I S. And I'll probably see Bob tomorrow. So I'll see if I can get some additional information if there's any kind of a streaming service that has that up. And I'll get back with our host to give them that information. Rick, it looks like somebody, one of our attendees has already put it in the chat. So thank you okay. so much. Thank you, whoever <laughs> did that. Thank you. Yeah, so so yeah, the answer, there's a link in the chat. And uh, and Rick, I have another question from, um, from Heidi, one of our hostesses here tonight. And, uh, and, and she has a couple of questions about, about the book the books themselves and uh and she'd like to know is how is the writing of this book that is the the alpha female wolf unique and has your writing process changed over time in this series well that that's an intriguing question thank you for for answering it i should be asking it um i take very detailed notes when I'm in the field. I'm sure Tom remembers that. I, I found what works most efficiently for me. I have a very small tape recorder. So I speak into that in the field. I'd say something like, oh, six is coming down from the den. She's crossed the road at 3.30 and she's uh, now feeding at the carcass uh, of the elk that they killed yesterday. And then I come home and I tr transcribe that. So I'm now getting close to having 12 thousand single space pages of those detailed field notes and then when i finished up with the park service working for the doing the wolf research in early 2018 i continued to go out every morning but then spent the rest of the day at home on my computer i started um, going back to the very earliest days of the wolf reintroduction my first book is called the rise of wolf eight he was one of the original wolves brought down from Alpha in the 1995 reintroduction. So his life story, the first book, The Rise of Wolf A, covers the first five years or so of the reintroduction. Um, many of the listeners here may know that he later adopted and raised a group of pups whose father had been illegally shot and killed. One of those pups that he adopted and raised was known as Wolf 21. So my second book, The Reign of 21, is 21 story. And 21 had a, a particularly long lasting and very deeply emotional relationship with his mate, 42. And that's the, the theme of his book, that relationship with his mate and how when he lost her, he um, pretty much fell apart and could not go on with life. It was, it's a very, very dramatic emotional story. The third book is very different because uh, it's about 302, who we've already touched upon, who was uh, 21's nephew, and they were just total opposites in character and personality. 
So uh, for almost all of his life, 302 was the most unreliable wolf we've ever had. But ironically, at the very end of a long, long life, he totally changed things around and uh, became an alpha male, much like eight and 21. It was just an unbelievable story. And at the climax of his life, the very last day that he lived, he became one of our greatest heroes, uh, something that we just absolutely never would have predicted, never in a million years. And in the fourth book, about 06, The Alpha Female Wolf, obviously it's mostly her story, but I also wanted to, to write about other great alpha males that we've had, alpha females that we've had over the years. And I especially wanted to stress the fact that in wolf societies, the alpha female is the real leader of the pack. As Tom knows, for a long time, wolf biologists um, assume that the bigger alpha male, just because of his size and his strength, he had to be the leader of the pack. But no, as we've discovered here in, the Yellow, in Yellowstone, um, the alpha female is the true boss of the operation. In military terms, she is the commanding officer and he just works for the commanding officer. And uh, what I've seen over the years is that the males are very, very willing to accept that deal. The females are in charge and they just work for them. All hey, right. This is Dodi. Um, and sorry to interrupt you, Tom. It was kind of funny when you were um, talking about all the really smart chicks in this wolf society. Um, it just there's a Grateful Dead lyric that's uh, that's right. The women are smarter. It just seems like <laughs> it just seems like female wolves are just like a little bit smarter. I mean, and is that a survival instinct or is that um, protection of their pups or you know what, what do you think drives that? Well, well, first of all, I totally agree that uh, every woman in my life is way smarter. Uh, than I am. So I'm on board with that. Right, Tom, do you agree with that? I'm sorry, say that again. I, I, I said I agree that all the females in my life are way smarter than I am. Is that the case with you too? <laughs> yeah, I, I would say so for sure. I, I often feel that. Um, okay, yeah, good. I, well, I'm out getting, with back, it. getting back to the wolves. Okay. Getting back to the wolves, I, I think what's really going on is um, they have an agenda. And the agenda is, okay, the mating, we're gonna mate, I'm gonna get pregnant in, in February. I'm gonna have my pups in April. I'm gonna have them at the den over at point X. We're gonna raise them there until they're whatever months old. Then we're gonna move them to a rendezvous site. Then we're gonna spend the fall at this other area. Then in the winter, we're gonna take them there. And then the next year we're gonna have more pups and we're gonna raise them. And the males I think are like, oh, okay. And they just kind of go along with the plan. Uh, I don't think the males have much of a plan other than trying to remember where they buried their last bone. So I think they're very willing to be led by the females who do have this agenda. And um, I, in, in a way, what I'm about to say is kind of a half joke, but it, it's half reality too, is um, I don't think male wolves have any clue where wolf pups come from. Um, they see the females go into a den and then a week or so later, these miniature baby wolves come out and I don't think they have any understanding of how that happens. To them, it's the equivalent of magic because they can't do that. Um, this is gonna seem like a, a strange quote to bring up in a wolf talk, but the science fiction writer, Isaac Asimov talking about aliens making contact with us made a famous statement where he said, any sufficiently advanced technology <laughs> is indistinguishable from magic. So I don't think the male wolves understand the female technology here. <laughs> So to them, it's, a, it's magic. And uh, if these females are capable of controlling magic, then you better do what you're told. Excellent, excellent. And I, I have, a, um, I have a, a question here um, 
from Sonia, and I think this is this might actually be even a little bit more for for Dodi. Um, and it says, and she's asked, uh, she's she stated that she's legally blind, and she'd like to know if your books are that is Rick's books are available on audio. Oh yes, yes they are. Yeah. Um, okay, wonderful. I know. I definitely know if people go on Amazon. I believe it's the uh, Audible uh, company that has them. So yes, all four of them are. And um, I, I don't know if the Denver Public Library has those type of audiobooks. Heidi or Dottie, uh, can you help me on that? Yeah, we have um, most of the audio of these, the Wolf, uh, Wolves of Yellowstone series, we have an e-audio format. Um, if that doesn't work for you uh, because it's using the Overdrive Libby download, um, the Colorado Talking Book Library can also service you, and you can find them okay. at uh, www.ctbl.org, and they will make sure you get uh, Rick's books in whatever format you may need, whether it's okay. um, mm -hmm. large print or e-book or e-audio or even through their own BARD service, so yeah. All of Rick's yeah. uh, Wolves series are available in audio. Excellent. And I've gotten a lot of feedback from people over the years that um, listen to the audio versions over and over again as they're driving and they all rave about um, the narration. So I, I can guarantee that um, whoever does that apparently just does a great, great job. I, I hear that all the time. And then, uh... I have a I have another question here from Josh, and I, I this one might be more appropriate um, for me to answer, Rick. But I, I'd certainly be interested, of course, in your opinion also, if you have anything to add to what I'll say in response to the question here. But but Josh states that Yellowstone was an unprecedented wolf observation opportunity. Colorado's wolf reintroduction won't have the same opportunity. Will not being able to follow wolf personalities and pack culture impact Colorado's success with reintroduction? Well, um, Tom, why don't, why don't you say a few things first and then I'll, I'll add a couple of comments or two. Go ahead. So, so you know, first, first things I'll, I'll say is that um, regardless of whether wolves are gonna be visible or not in Colorado, what ultimately is going to drive the success of the Colorado wolf restoration and reintroduction and wolf and restoration in the long run is going to be whether or not people accept having wolves on the landscape. And in that sense, you know, you, there's a certain, you know, reality that I've had to accept that wolves have a certain, have a political component. And it's going to be up to the people of Colorado to decide whether or not we're going to have wolves on this landscape and how we're going to have them here. And if you're concerned about the future of wolves in Colorado, I would really encourage you to reach out to the government, the, 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 the different branches of government really that are going to be administering this program and whether that means your lawmakers in the general assembly who are going to be passing laws about wolves uh, for example right now there's a bill uh senate 256 that's uh, moved from the senate to the house um you know this initially this bill would have delayed wolf restoration in colorado up to 10 years now some of that offensive language was removed uh, but this this bill the bear uh, this bill, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a second. So this, so this bill wants wants to require Colorado to have a 10J, uh, and I think Rick understands what the 10J is. It designates the wolves here in Colorado as an experimental population, and it makes it more reasonable to have um, have the wolves be managed for a variety of reasons. Um, that, that get kind of complicated, so I'm not going to discuss those specific reasons. But, but this is a the, the the 10J is a common sense thing to ask for. However, this bill is basically taking this common sense idea of having a 10J and 
and and holding the whole wolf restoration here in Colorado as hostage. So I really encourage people to reach out and, and, and do a little more research here. I don't really have the time to get into the complicated nuances of it, but do some more research about what this bill is going to do and reach out to your representative and let them know how you feel. Reach out to Gover Governor Polis and let him know that you think that if this bill should pass, that he needs to veto it. I would also go on and say that uh, you know, there's ample opportunities to talk to parks and wildlife uh, and fish and wildlife and let them know what you think about wolves here, here in the state. Um, I, think, I think for me personally, I might not ever see a wolf in Colorado. I don't really, I, I don't really expect to be able to do wolf watching in Colorado in the same way that I did in Yellowstone. However, if I find a track or I hear a howl, I think I think that's the kind of wilderness experience many people are going to be just are going to be thrilled by, and it's going to feel like a, a wilder place, a more complete place. Um, and I, I'm not entirely sold that we won't have some type of wolf watching opportunity here in Colorado. Uh, I think I think there's a reasonable attempt or a chance rather that we might be able to see wolves in, um, in places like Rocky Mountain National Park. Maybe not with the same regularity, but I think there's a possibility. We didn't expect ever to see wolves in, in Yellowstone in the first place. And yet within days of the release in 1995, the Crystal Creek Pack was very visible. And uh, Rick, would you like to add something to that? Well, Tom, I'm all for what you said, so I definitely back you up. Um, I lived in Colorado for a while in the 90s um, before uh, all this came about. I did a lot of research uh, back then for a book that I was working on called War Against the Wolf, where I went down to the Denver Public Library, spent a lot of time at CSU Library uh, researching um, uh, the story, the history of wolves in Colorado. And um, as Tom knows, back in the, the 20s on into the 30s, maybe through the early 40s, um, uh, there was a wolf population in the state, but federal agents uh, were given the task of um, killing off every single one of them. Um, there are, are, are tremendous stories of wolves that became legends back during those decades. Uh, legendary wolves that were the last ones in Colorado. So, you know, certainly the, the main argument in this uh, bringing wolves to Colorado right now is that um, long ago, they were here before us. Uh, they probably were a native animal for tens of thousands of years uh, throughout the entire area that is now Colorado. They deserve to be brought back just like they, uh, it was right to bring them back into Yellowstone. And what's exciting about the Colorado story is if you visualize a, a map of the Western United States, um, wolves are back in Wyoming, Montana, Washington State, uh, Oregon, even California, along with New Mexico and Arizona. So right at this moment, um, if we bring them back to Colorado, then it's just, um, Nevada and Utah to fill in the gaps to what was an original widespread wolf population throughout the Western United States. And, and what a story that will be, that it was our species that chose to exterminate the gray wolf in North America, going all the way back to the days of the pilgrims. And the fact that it's our species that's restoring them to the Western states, um, that's a pretty good story to tell. It, it, it really is. It really is. Uh, you know, and I, I'm looking at your book right now as we speak, and I'm looking at a discussion that you had with um, a couple of, of, of Native Americans who, who, who have gone to Yellowstone since the very first year to conduct wolf blessing ceremonies. And one of the things that they say is that it, it's good to be part of putting something back rather than taking something away. And that, is, that has provided quite a bit of motivation uh, for me. And, and initially when, when, I was, um, yes. uh -huh. when I was young and 
uh, I, I made comments in support of the EIS for, for the, the Yellowstone and well, the Northern Rockies really r restoration. And now here in Colorado, um, you know, I, I really like the discussion that they have. Uh, I, you know, saying that, that, that the spirits of all the wolves are calling back back the wolves and, and that it's also that the, the spirits of the wolves who lived here before have, have called through people like yourself, myself, anybody who's helped. And they, they were specifically referencing Yellowstone, but I've often felt that about Colorado as well. You know, I, I know some of those stories you mentioned about how wolves were present in Colorado up into the 20s and 30s, and that they were they were hunted out until um, you know they were they were they were extirpated, they were killed off in the state. And some of those stories are just are, are horrible to me because they're really tales about the last wolves. And these wolves were very wily and they were persistent. They demonstrated the best aspects of wolf personality, in my opinion, yet they were being hunted down to the last animal. And they even had, they even had names, uh, uh, Rags the Digger, um, the Custer Wolf, the, the Queen of the Unaweep. And one, one wolf I remember particularly well was called the Greenhorn Wolf. And the reason I remember this wolf story is because when I went to work at Mission Wolf, Mission Wolf is in the um, shadow of Greenhorn Mountain. And I thought on my very first visit in 1991, I thought, how ironic it is that I have to go down to a facility to see captive wolves after all the, the wild wolves have been killed off. And I, I, I thought at that moment that somehow I was being led in a direction and I've, I've never let go of that, of that impression. Yes, Tom, if I, just as we finish up here, I, I'll just um, add a little bit to what you so effectively spoke of. Um, the, the native man that you're referring to is Scott Frazier. And um, he and some native companions um, on the, the day back in, well, it was January 12th, 1995, when the first truckload of um, wolves coming into Yellowstone came through the arch at the north entrance, uh, native people were there to have a welcoming ceremony. And uh, when Scott, who had his turn to speak at that exact moment, uh, he was the one that said those words, which are, are so emotional for us. And I'll, I'll repeat them one more time because of the, the weight of the wolves. It is good mm -hmm. to be part of putting something back than to take something away. So for a Native American to say that at the very moment when wolves are being brought back to Yellowstone um, was the best possible summary of what we were trying to do. And I think those same exact words fit perfectly to the Colorado story. Um, wolves were native as you've been saying to Colorado. Um, it is good to be putting something back. Well said, Rick. And uh, I'm wondering, uh, do we have time for one more question from our audience? Sure, go ahead, go ahead. All right, so uh, Rick, Suzanne asks, if you have formed any opinions about how the wolves all lived through the Molly's pack attack, were any obviously injured? And could you go near the den site to see that for yourself? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. In the interest of time, I was a little bit concerned about how much details I should go into. So of course we waited until the family had, uh, we knew for sure that they had left the den for good that fall. And then um, one of the other Wolf Project people accompanied me up there. And we realized that 06 had planned for this contingency. So instead of denning at um, the original site, which was under a tree, a site that would have been um, difficult for the two males to defend. So let's just say if they were standing in front of the entrance under one section of the tree roots and fighting off wolves there, other wolves could be at the backside and digging out um, a hole there. So we discovered that 06 had found a cave-like structure 
uh, way back in the forest. There were giant pieces of conglomerate rocks that had fallen down from a cliff, pieces of, of rocks that were the size of houses. And there were no true caves there, but we found that she had denned that spring. We didn't know it at the time. And one amounted to kind of an enclave under one of those giant rocks. So if you picture a huge rock the size of a normal house, um, there was a crawl space under that rock that a mother wolf could just barely squeeze into. And she had her pups at the far end of that um, where the pups themselves, if there was danger, they could squirm back uh, even a little bit further and be totally out of reach of any uh, adult wolves that were trying to kill them. So to sum that up, the first line of defense were the two brothers. If they had been killed, and they weren't, but if they had been killed, then that equivalent of a safe room that 06 had planned for her pups, that would have saved their lives. So that's just another testimony to her extreme intelligence and foresight. Probably she was the smartest wolf that we've ever had. Wow. Wow. Um, well, I have, I have a litany of questions here I'd love to ask for myself, but I'm concerned that uh, we're running out of time and it might be time to wrap up. I'm not sure how uh, we're all feeling, if we're a little fatigued or um, what the thoughts are here. Oh, and I, I do have one more audience question that actually is um, from, from Heidi herself, um, our, our, our host at the Denver Public Library, one of our hosts. And um, um, I was wondering, and she's wondering for Rick, how do you see storytelling finding its place in the effort to restore and sustain wolf populations? You know, that's actually an especially good question to finish up on. Uh, so thank, thanks the, thank you for asking that. Um, I think Tom knows, but may, I guess the listeners wouldn't know that my degree is not in wildlife biology, it's actually in forestry. So um, all of the people that I've worked with over the years, as far as I know, they all have at least bachelor's, if not master's and PhD in wildlife biology, and I don't. Uh, but I've been a park ranger for the park service for my entire adult life. I worked in Alaska for 15 years, so I've been all over. And um, although I'm not a technically a, a trained wildlife biologist, I've been a park service naturalist for the first half of my career. And the naturalist rangers are the ones that do the programs for visitors, the, the campfire talks, the slideshows, the kids programs. So the first half of my career, that was my specialty, interpreting the natural world and wildlife to park visitors. And um, that really served me well in Yellowstone. Because as I watched and recorded the behavior of the wolves, as Tom knows, nearly all the time I was with park visitors. So both Tom and myself, when we were working, we would invite them over to see the wolves through the, our scopes and then tell them stories about the wolves that they were seeing. So the stories that Tom and I were telling uh, folks today at this program about 06 and some of the other Yellowstone wolves, if you had been with us many years ago during the lifetime of 06, you could have actually been standing beside us and heard those stories firsthand from us. So that's what I see as my purpose in life, my, my mission. I'm, I'm not really <laughs> uh, in, in uh, the um, domain of trying to publish scientific papers that no one is ever gonna read about wolf DNA or wolf, um, genetics. Uh, I want to tell stories, true stories about wolves. That's what I'm here for. Mm -hmm. Stories like the ones that we've just told, told about 06 and 755, 754, 926, etc. cetera. And uh, the reason I do that is a story has the power to change the world. Another research paper published in some obscure journal that's fine, and I, I appreciate the biologists that do that, but to be blunt, that's not going to change the world. 
a story of 06, like it did with that young boy, that's what has the story to, that, it, that has the power to change the world. And maybe that's a point to finish up on the power I, of the story, because that relates very well to the purpose of the library. It, it sure does. And uh, Rick, thank you so much for uh, being here tonight with me and with especially the Denver Public Library for hosting us. And um, I'm gonna turn this back over to Heidi now who'd like to uh, wrap things up. And as always, Rick, it's wonderful to talk to you and I hope I get to see you sooner than later. Okay, Tom, thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Tom. Um, that was so wonderful. And thank you everyone for being here. We really, really appreciate it. Um, this has been a very impactful hour and hour and a half. Um, so I just wanna offer my sincerest thanks for everybody uh, for being here tonight. We did record the session. So um, everyone who registered will see a link coming their way. Otherwise you can check the Denver Public Library YouTube channel shortly. Um, and if you are interested in reading any of Rick's books, we do have them all in the catalog, um, or you can purchase them online as well through the bookies. Um, so thank you to everyone. And Dodie, do you have any other last comments? Oh, no, just, um, I'm just so grateful to have um, caught Rick last fall at the Mountain and Plains Booksellers Association. And I know, um, Rocky Mountain booksellers and libraries uh, always have books or Rick's books in stock. And we're just so appreciative to have somebody out there rooting for our wolves. Thank you. And for librarians too. <laughs> we do what we can. We love it. And we've, we, we had a wolf. We had all your books on display in our Earth Day display at the library. So um yes we're insidious so and we love it that way so <laughs> that's great <laughs> thank you heidi thank you tom thank you rick it's been just a fantastic evening and uh watch for a notice from all of us uh telling us where you can find this on youtube good night good night okay. everybody thank you everyone thank you thank you bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.